Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We will be starting the webinar in about one minute. All right, good morning, everybody that is joining us today. My name is Armando Berdiel, Technical Development Supervisor with Lighting Design Lab, and this is our first uh, webinar delivery for 2021. Happy New Year, everybody. And we will be uh, talking about the 2018 Energy Code for Seattle and Washington State, specifically the HVAC portion for today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before we begin the webinar, uh, just note everyone is going to be muted. Uh, please use the chat features to engage with us, ask any questions, drop any comments. Uh, the presenters may pause uh, periodically to, to allow time for, for questions. Uh, and we'll, at the very end, we'll be having a few online polls, so please participate in those. Uh, after the webinar, there's going to be a 30-second survey on how the experience was. Please uh, take this short survey. Uh, we'll have a recording of this webinar on our website as well as our YouTube channel. You can access it there. And if you have any questions, please reach out to Lighting Design Lab at seattle.gov. Uh, next slide, please. Going on to thank you very much. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by Lighting Design Lab, uh, connected uh, connected lighting education hub. Uh, the Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections, as well as the Customer Care and Energy Solutions Division, all for Seattle City Light. Uh, at, the, at the latter part of this webinar, you'll even have an opportunity to, to talk with Emma Johnson. She is the program implementer for uh, our Customer Care and Energy Solutions Division, and she'll be uh, eager to engage with you guys in questions. Uh, without further ado, let me give it along to our speakers. First will be uh, Ben Rausch. Hey there. Let me turn on my video too so you can actually see what I look like. Although I look a lot like that guy, just with longer pandemic level <laughs> hair. Um, I'm Ben Rausch, principal at FSI. Uh, a bunch of letters after my name that we'll talk about a little later on, but I am a mechanical and fire protection engineer. I run our sustainable engineering group and our commissioning groups and uh, really target net zero. And the most important one there is I really do geek out on the code. Um, let's go to the next slide and that's Zach. Hey, good morning. My name is Zach Smith. I also look like the guy in the photo with a recently trimmed beard and crazy pandemic hair. Um, like Ben, I work for FSI engineers, and I also focus on sustainable mechanical engineering. I lead our airflow modeling department at the company, uh, computational fluid dynamics, and I also am a project manager for LEED and Living Building Challenge projects, with uh, recently having the Mukilteo Ferry Terminal, which was LEED gold, and uh, as close to net zero as we can get a 24-hour facility to get. Uh, next slide, please, for Dwayne. So... I've been doing this uh, Energy Code Geek since uh, uh, 2012, but I used to be an architect, usually as the technical guy on big complex projects. Um, my main theme for us here today is this is all doable, we can make it happen, okay? Uh, we've got state and city legislation that tells us we've got to make these things big leaps in efficiency. I, I just saw also some proposed state legislation saying we need to get to that 70% reduction by 2027 instead of 2030. Uh, and pre-pandemic, I was hearing similar things from the mayor here in Seattle. So the question is, what's the smartest and most effective way to get there? And, and talking about timing, by the way, a lot of you have heard that last week, the State Building Code Council voted to delay implementation of all the 2018 technical codes until July, but some appeals have been filed with the governor's office that I'm aware of, and so we'll know by the end of this week whether the, that delay sticks or if it goes back to February 1st for the state and March 15th for 
Seattle. Of, of these four guiding principles that we used for developing the Seattle amendments, we're gonna to focus today on moving beyond fossil fuels and on making super efficient use of our clean electricity in the HVAC world. That's an architect talking though, and there's a good reason we have uh, Ben and Zach along uh, with us here. So let's get the big picture from an actual engineer, okay? We'll see how good these guys are. Uh, ben. <laughs> <laughs> Put us on the spot. Good news, we're prepared like engineers. Um, so we are here to talk about, and it is named cost-effective solutions and you know principles. Um, and and we are we are going to bring a lot of solutions today. Uh, we really have to start at the very beginning of chapter four in C four hundred one, where you get three paths, and if you're familiar with the IECC or previous versions of the code. The 90.1 path is now the total building performance path. The center one there lives in C407. The outcome-based energy budget, which is to say the, the thing only Seattle was doing, now lives in an appendix and has to be adopted by the local authority having jurisdiction, which is why there's an X over it, because many AHJs will not adopt it. And then we're going to spend most of our time here talking about the prescriptive path, which is all of the other C4Os, whatever, um, that isn't the energy modeling. Um, so let's go to the next slide. We have to get into basics first. We have to talk about heat pumps and, and coefficient of performance and what does that mean. And for the mechanical in, in engineers in the room, you can zone out for the next 30 seconds. And for anyone else, Great, we're, we're doing this just to make sure we're all on the same same basis. So you've got your electric tea kettle there or any electric resistance device, you know, electric radiators, mm -hmm. electric heaters, they have a COP of one. You put one kilowatt in, they give you one kilowatt back out in heat. Great, COP of one. In a refrigeration cycle, you're not creating heat, you're moving it from one place to another. And with a heat pump, that's from outside to inside in the winter and from inside to outside in the summer with air conditioning. Um, and those have a COP of give or take, depends on the exact equipment, but you can assume they have a COP of about three. Um, and the slides are changing, there you go. And that means you put one kilowatt in, you get three kilowatts out in heat. So they are three times more efficient. You could say 300% efficient. Let's go to the next slide. So the, the basic systems you see are from left to right, a split system heat pump, a package terminal air conditioner, often also a heat pump with electric resistance, um, and a vertical packaged unit. They're very simple, very cheap systems. Let's go to the next slide. There are also better systems that are VRF in the upper left, um, a pack, take on the package terminal unit in the bottom left that just has two little outlets to outside and a higher performance compressor. Um, the Mitsubishi split system down there on the bottom middle and a Friedrich VHP um, that does a, um, a variable speed compressor. So the thing all of these share in common is they have variable speed compressors and I'm gonna show you why that's important in a second. Next slide. Huh. Let's go next slide again. That is an erroneous extra slide. Um, yeah, keep going. There we go. Um, so, nope, that slide. So the traditional heat pumps, the single speed compressors, you in Seattle probably need backup heat. That's also known as emergency heat on most of our thermostats or just supplemental heat. And there are limitations for what you're allowed to have in the code. You can have 50% of the heat pump capacity at HRI rating system, rating conditions for heating, um, you're allowed to have 50% of that in electric resistance backup. So in a traditional heat pump, you can probably get there. Seattle, you can definitely get there. Spokane, you can probably get there, maybe. It depends on the exact heat pump. And these are the cheap versions. Let's go to the next slide that shows the, the more expensive, but also higher performing um, variable speed, the other slide. Wait, wait, you had it. I did? No, um, we're going to slide 18 if you're looking for it. There you go. 
that one. Thank you. Um, so these are variable speed. These are specifically from Daikin and their VRF system, but you would see similar curves from other manufacturers. The big takeaway is in Seattle, our design temp, you have no reduction in capacity. And if you look, you've got a little reduction in COP. So the colder it is outside, the harder the heat pump has to work. That's what you're seeing on the right. But even at a Spokane design temperature, you're still at a COP of 2.5, or another way to say it is 250% efficient. So, so much better than electric resistance. And for Spokane, Daikin makes equipment that you don't need backup heating for, um, or you can choose their less fancy equipment and put in a little backup electric resistance. So from a technical standpoint, heat pumps are perfectly possible, uh, particularly with the higher end compressors. Dwayne. So, um... We want to stay focused on the big slices of the energy pie. And, and today we've got a couple of the biggest slices that are under the control of the design team, heating and cooling. This is this uh, and and the rest of those bullet points on big slices we'll cover in the next three weeks. But uh, we've been striving to find options that make real progress, but that do it in the most economical way possible. But Ben, I think you have a thing or two to say about cost, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I already said more expensive when talking about the better compressors on heat pumps. Uh, this is another Daikin graph. And being a manufacturer graph, take it with a, a grain of salt. But electric versus gas, you can see that versus oil. Um, and for their nationwide study, they're saying, particularly at a Seattle design temperature, uh, per million BTU output for heat, you're already at a cheaper rate. And our calcs move this curve a little to the right. It's it's slightly warmer than that. Um, but you are, you are saving energy. And certainly at our more mild conditions, not our worst case day ever, um, you, you are seeing savings. Go to the next slide. So Dwayne asked me to talk about specifically on cost and cost effectiveness, what do we need to pay attention to? So my biggest one is who pays for the energy versus who pays for the slightly higher first cost of equipment. So if the developer, and I think of this in multifamily building, buildings particularly, if the developer is paying a high, higher first cost for slightly better equipment, but the tenant is paying all of the electricity costs and getting all the benefit of that equipment, you have a mismatch. And there's there are leasing agreements and ways to work that out so you don't have a mismatch. Um, We've been doing a lot of multifamily like housing in senior living. And in that case, the developer has a strong incentive to save energy and they're highly motivated. Um, so, so solving that disconnect is one of our big ones. And the code minimum is now bringing that, that floor up just a little, just a hair to, uh, to developers who are gonna keep that incentive structure. All right. So I wanted to mention, a, a just a couple things from the envelope section, even though we're on an HVAC talk today. Uh, and and uh, here's a, a code provision that we, we took from New York City code. Um, PTACs are popular, especially in budget hotels. You've probably heard them rattling to life and waking you up um, because they're really cheap, uh, but they leak heat and leak air like crazy. So we're requiring in this code that the envelope calculations reflect that uh, if you're using a lot of through wall mechanical stuff like PTACs or PTHPs, uh, that that your calcs have to reflect that they lose about 10 times the heat per square foot than the rest of the wall does. Not to mention how much air leaks out. Uh, if you're if you're getting yourself set up for for um, air barrier testing, you cannot tape that intersection around the perimeter of the uh, uh, of the PTAC where it where it fits into the wall. That's that's a, an intentional opening really. Um, so uh, buyer beware. And the other thing I wanted to mention about in passing about uh, the envelope is that the air barrier test, which up till now you had to take the air barrier test, but you didn't actually have to pass it. Uh, in this code, no, you got to pass at that old rate of, of 0 0.40 CFM. Um, and, and the reason I'm bringing it up is that 
there's still a lot of engineers that have been using their old air leakage factors from the bad old days for sizing their equipment, but you'll be oversizing a lot if you do not take into account the fact that, that we've really tightened up envelopes. And from now on, you just don't get your CFO unless you, um, uh, unless you pass that test. And that is true for, for both the state and for Seattle. Now, I had uh, intended to give you a slide here which showed the organizational structure of that HVAC section. You know, I was gonna somehow clarify that for you, but it really seems to be like an attic where everyone just tossed things in and let them land wherever. Uh, so there really, uh, there isn't a good sort of organizational structure to the way that the code sections are laid out, but I think Ben has another organizational structure in mind here. Yeah, and so this is straight from the 2015 codes, the dedicated outside air system, DOAS requirement. We're gonna be saying that term a lot today, so we defined it the first time you see it. Uh, there is a new requirement for the total system performance ratio, which we're also going to spend a good deal of time talking about a little later on. And we had this thing where we said, great, where do these fit in? How should we be thinking about this? That same three paths I said before, where we X'd out the one on the right, the Appendix F, because most people won't take it. Great. The total building performance path. Did we'll we speak lose about you, Ben? You there? Yeah. L loud and clear on all fronts. Okay, okay. great. Um, the C407, we'll speak about at length. And then in the prescriptive path, you have to know what kind of occupancy you are. And we'll talk about that at length as well but you'll either trigger DOAS and TSPR or you won't. And that'll be like a choose your own adventure or have your adventure chosen for you path through C403. So here we go, hang on for the ride. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so things that are unchanged, we wanna talk about the mechanical efficiencies except for a few select equipment, they don't do much. We're saying that there are now heat pump, um, heat pump um, chillers and heat recovery chillers, same thing. And we'll talk about that a little later on and how they don't necessarily have their ratings yet. Uh, mechanical controls got a couple new things. Uh, the biggest one is that if you have outdoor doors, uh, outdoor going doors without vestibules, you're going to have some level of heat recovery to automatically reset the thermostat, which I think will drive occupants crazy. So that's a strong plug for all outside doors get vestibules or a, you know, a five foot walkthrough, um, double, double door in, at the end of corridors, call them vestibules. Um, other than that, the big ones are this total system performance ratio we'll speak about, and then C407 changes it's going to be a long section. All right, Dwayne. And what Ben just mentioned about the the controls, if if with a new building now, if you prop your front doors open because it seems like a nice day or whatever, uh, after five minutes or something like that, the the uh, heating or air conditioning in that space that the door is open to will shut down. Um, Data centers, uh, Washington took on the 2016 version of the new ASHRAE 90.4 standard for data center cooling, um, and then modified some of the values to give it a little more teeth. But by the time Seattle started looking at it in this past year, the 2019 version of 90.4 was already out and was much improved, fixed a lot of problems from before. So we adopted that version with no changes. Uh, so you got, 2016 with a couple of changes for the state and 2019 with no changes uh, for Seattle. But Ben, what is a data center anyway? <laughs> uh, like the engineer I am, I felt like I had to put the definitions from chapter two in. Um, so data center means that you're exceeding 20 watts per square foot of conditioned area in equipment power density. So that is not lighting, that is not anything else, that is the uh, IT equipment. Um, so great, you're a data center. If you're less than 20 watts per square foot, you're a computer room. And so in general, they don't. There, there is no size definition beyond that. Um, so we'll get there in a second. And 
it's important that many we've done a good many you know city hall type buildings or office buildings that their data rooms would count as a data center because they have blade servers and big racks and they've really crammed it in um so you would be triggering that here that, that's a thing to consider in your designs um so if you trigger this if you are a data center you go to 90.4 and you start looking at section six and eight that are required um our historic metric has been power usage effectiveness, um, which is the whole building. And then 90.4 actually divides that out into components. And for the purposes of the energy code, we only care about, again, section six is HVAC and section eight is electrical. Uh, and it also includes some climate uh, zone adjustments. Great. It uses a different rating, a mechanical load component, which is the HVAC power divided by the uh, total information technology equipment power. Great, and you've got a couple factors you've got to meet. We're saying this was released in 2016. So when Duane said we referenced the 2016 version in the state code, great, that was the first version. Uh, in 2019 for Seattle, that's what it references, they added factors for various sizes of data centers. So smaller data centers get more favorable factors. And if you're outside of Seattle, you might consider asking for, for that change to allow to, to go to 2019. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, and and uh, w one thing I'd mentioned here is that is that we don't actually require that you recapture and reuse that data center heat, but that's a pretty reliable long-term source of heat for any engineer who's creative enough to want to grab that on the way out. Yep. Okay, TSPR, uh, a another acronym for you. Um, the total system performance ratio was designed first for Washington State here, although it's spreading uh, perhaps nationwide now, designed as a backstop to ensure that your HVAC system is at least as efficient as what we designated a pretty good system for each of four occupancy types, office, retail, library, education. And Seattle has added multifamily and most medical office buildings. So a positive ratio is good. It compares your annual heating and cooling loads to your annual carbon emissions from your building. Uh, and the lower your emissions, the better your ratio. There is a free online calculation tool that PNNL has developed for us. Uh, but for more on this, I will turn you over to somebody who actually knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Take it away. So, so we poked at the tool and as the code implementation date continues to move out we continue to do the early design saying oh we'll be in the new code cycle and then the date moves out and we and we haven't followed through all the way through design with one of these yet but i i'm here to tell you this model this particular model took i don't know 20 minutes maybe 30 minutes to put together including all of the input and the poking i wanted to do on it so it's it's much much less time than a, a full-scale energy model and it's really big box geometry. You're gonna build giant volumes, not individual rooms. Um, TSPR applies to office, retail, library, and education, which should sound a lot like the list that you'll all recall, I'm sure, from last time from C403.6 of the 2015 code for DOAS. I'm sure you all remember that. Um, which means that almost any TSPR system is gonna require the DOAS provisions we should be saying most every, um, and we'll have energy recovery already. Um, on what we've done poking at it, if you use electric resistance, it's the worst for carbon. And I'll show you that on the on the next slide. We can go to the next slide. Um, on a unit per, per unit basis, uh, electric resistance is the worst for carbon emissions, followed by natural gas. And then heat pumps are better by, you know, again, about a factor of three. So basing, uh, poking on this specifically, we did a school project. When it was heating only, we could use electric resistance, the worst thing. But if you added cooling, you failed again. Um, and if you did cooling and natural gas with DOAS, you passed. If you did cooling with a heat pump, uh, cooling and heating with heat pumps and, and DOAS, you passed. And again, DOAS is going to be required for most every building you're going to be doing for TSBR. So it's a, it's a pretty simple thing know that electric resistance and to some extent natural gas will be difficult to pass. Go to the next slide. 
Well, I, I might just toss in there that that uh, utilities uh, or jurisdictions might use this uh, item for for uh, giving you various kinds of incentives. So it might be that if you get a a, a ratio of 1.05 or 1.1 or something like that, that you can get certain benefits, but that'll be developed over the next several months. Um, okay. So this is a, a long slide on what are the baseline systems and it very much depends on your occupancy. So you can see that across the top of these, across the top of these um, tables. So if you're a small office versus a large office, you'll have different um, different requirements and different different baselines and you're defining that in the tool so this sounds like you're gonna have to build this big baseline but you don't you, you tell the tool your parameters and what your building is used for it does all the backup work on that on that baseline it's really quite easy uh, I should say you want to be doing this very early in your design it would be the height of embarrass embarrassment to be a mechanical engineer get all the way to permitting and say oh Oh, just kidding, can't use gas heat on this one. Got to switch to a VRF. It, it just, you know, that would be horrible for your client, horrible for you. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So TSPR is doing this on a carbon basis. I want to tie this back to carbon. So this is from the EPA grid finder. It's 639 pounds per megawatt hour CO2 from the grid. Great, let's go to the next slide. We also know that the grid, at least for Washington's, uh, although we are part of a larger grid, the whole PN, uh, uh, PNPP, um, sorry, NWPP um, grid. Uh, so Washington is pushing for decarbonizing our grid, any electricity we use in Washington, carbon neutrality by 2030 and carbon free by 2045. Let's go next slide. Like any engineer, I made a graph. You know, this is an obvious one. So the yellow line uh, is electricity. And if you use electric resistance, 100% efficient, you're following that yellow line. So over time, you're getting better on a carbon basis, even though you're just 100% efficient and it was the worst thing in TSPR. Um, the blue line is a heat pump. It's 300% uh, efficient, COP of three. The uh, low blue line, there's a purpley blue line through the middle. Uh, that is natural gas. It always stays exactly the same. You burn natural gas, you're going to have that. But the orange and yellow curves, uh, sorry, orange and gray curves are boilers over time because they lose derating. So what you can take away is a code minimum boiler and electric resistance right now in 2020 are about the same carbon emissions. Um, and the gray line, a condensing gas boiler, slightly better than electric resistance. But in all cases, heat pumps beat everything else on a carbon basis by quite a lot, by a factor of three. And over time, they're going to they're going to be one of the few options that goes to carbon zero. It's electric resistance and heat pumps will go to zero carbon. Let's go next slide. Okay, so now we're on to our next acronym, DOAS, Dedicated Outdoor Air System. By the way, if you want to be cool around people, you don't say a DOAS system because systems already part of DOAS. You say, oh, we got a DOAS. But um, it already applies to office, education, retail, and library. Does that list sound familiar? But this year we've added most assembly occupancies. And we also took away a few goodies that went along with DOAS last time. So you no longer get C406 credits or extra glazing area with it. Now. We put this nifty table into the code to clarify exactly what spaces do and do not have to comply with DOAS since it was a little ambiguous last cycle. And you can see in the top few lines which assembly occupancies have to comply. One notable exception I'd point out is dining areas, A2, which don't have to uh, typically comply. Uh, and A4 and A5, if you're wondering, are like arenas and pools and stadiums. But Ben, Tell them how to do a, a DOAS at, a, say, a concert hall. Yeah. So, whoop, too far. Dwayne asked me, you know, we added all these assembly occupancies from the last version of the code. What, what does that mean? So I thought about large concert halls, large lecture rooms, things like that, where 
you've got DOAS and you're also gonna have demand control ventilation requirements and you're gonna have this really large turndown. And what does that mean for fan sizing? Um, and so fan sizing, if you just sized one big fan and you needed it to turn down, I did a calc that you know you, you need to be able to turn down by a factor of 12. In an, in an auditorium to the minimum ventilation versus the full occupancy ventilation. Um, if you just try to do that with one fan, that's gonna be a very difficult, possibly impossible selection. That said, we aren't sizing a whole lot of large air handlers with just one giant mega fan anymore. Um, and more is the pity because they were the coolest things ever. But we are doing things like fan system walls, fan walls, they get called different things. There's a picture one, Zach will talk a little more about it later, show you another example. Um, and this gives you quite a lot of flexibility. These little turn fans, you can have some backdraft dampers and turn them off. Um, you can ramp them all up and down together. You can ramp individual fans. There's quite a lot of control in these little arrays. So I don't, I don't think this is gonna be a very hard thing. It's also worth saying you're gonna have energy recovery requirements in this DOAS. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that later. That energy recovery is also gonna require a, a careful selection. Um, if you don't like these, if you just hate this as an approach, you can always go to an energy model approach that we'll talk about later. All right, back to you, Duane. I thought this picture was a display of somebody's gold records, but <laughs> I guess that's a um, so. Now, buildings with DOAS also have to comply with economizer rules uh, under this new code, unless your equipment is buried in some interior room with no access to outside air at all. Somebody ran the numbers last year, and it was clear that even a building with DOAS gets serious benefits from economizer cooling. Um, so in the state code, if you've got DOAS and demand control ventilation, DCV, you don't need energy recovery, but in Seattle, you do need energy recovery for anything larger than 650 square feet. So 650 is a pretty substantial conference room, right? But um, also in, in Seattle, you need uh, DCV for retail and a couple other minor, minor space types because we we uh, brought down the, the density of occupants that, that picks that up. Uh, and I actually like that one because retail like right now, well, retail is a disaster, but typically late January, uh, those department stores and stuff are just dead. There's a few employees walking around. Uh, and then, you know, last month during the holiday rush, they would be packed full of people, especially on the main floor. So, so it really does make sense to not have that same level of ventilation running year round. But now we're gonna hear more, I hope a lot more uh, about DOAS from Mr. Zach. Thanks, Dwayne. I appreciate it. So we're going to go through a couple of different slides to sort of walk through the difference between a conventional VAV system, which is something that we're seeing on screen right now, to what a DOAS looks like by code language. So looking at this image, you have your VAV, the little green square located on the top middle, that's recirculating the air from the conditioned space. It also has a connection on the left for outside air, where we're mixing our, our required ventilation rate with the existing airflow in the space. And that's how we're getting our fresh air to the space. When we use the word economizer, we're referring to economizer, which is gonna come up in the next couple of slides and later in this presentation. Economizer refers to using the temperature of the air to help you condition the space. So imagine a cool summer day, we turn off the, heat, the heating and cooling going to that VAV and we just supply the air at its temperature outside directly into the space. And that gives us, you know, quote unquote, free cooling. You don't have to use energy in order to cool the space. Can you go to the next slide, please? So as Duane mentioned, this is a DOAS system, a dedicated outdoor air system, system using the word twice. And the main idea here is that we're decoupling our ventilation load from our heating and cooling system. So you could now see that the image is sort of separated in two. The top half, you have your outside air going directly to an outside air unit, which leads to the space. And then you have some kind of indoor HVAC unit, whether that's a fan coil unit or a chilled beam, radiant floor, something like that. 
And the main idea here is, again, we're trying to reduce the amount of energy that we're using in order to effectively heat, cool, and ventilate the space. Air is a poor medium of conveying heat transfer in comparison to water, refrigerant, or any of those other means. So we want to size our ventilation load just to provide ventilation, and we're doing our heating and cooling via some other means using some other fluid. So ASHRAE 62.1 tells us how to size our airflow system, and it splits it up into an area method, which is basically sizing your ventilation load. Your minimum load will be by the occupancy type and how large that occupancy type is. And then your maximum load, your outdoor air system maximum load will be that area plus whatever population you're expecting to see in that space. How this turns out is you're gonna see smaller ductwork, but larger piping systems. Again, the pipes are still pretty small, but your ductwork is gonna get a lot smaller. And then the idea here is that you're always providing some minimum flow of, of ventilation with the ability to turn off your heating or cooling system and saving the energy in that way. Because of that, sit with, with uh, fan coil units, we can't have an outside air connection going directly into the back of a fan coil unit anymore because you wouldn't be able to turn off the heating and cooling system and still provide uh, your ventilation. And this, when we're talking about DOAS, this is probably DOAS as an engineer would know it. Um, the next slide is the DOAS as the code knows it. And the difference here or the addition here is ERV or HRV, energy recovery ventilator or heat recovery ventilator. A heat recovery ventilator is what you're seeing in this image. So it's the exact same image as the last slide, except you could see the orange arrows moving from right to left that has the descriptor of the exhaust air. So you have your outside air delivered to the space, and then you have your exhaust air, which is already temperature controlled, being removed through that same DOAS unit. And what that gives you is another free form of energy recovery. You have your, let's say you have um, a space that's at a set point temperature of somewhere in the 80s, and you have, you, have, you have an outside air temperature on a cold Seattle day of, let's say your 24 degree design day. You take that, exhaust air that's at temperature and you run it through an element, whether that's a, a wheel or a core or a stationary element that will heat up based on that temperature. And then you could use that free preheat for your incoming outside air. Um, your energy recovery ventilator is a similar idea, but the one difference is you're trying to maintain moisture in your interior zones. So there's a little bit of an of a, a additional piece there. An example of this will be on the next slide, if you will, Dwayne. So here we have two images, two different styles of units. The left image, uh, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is on the top left, you'll see two fans located side by side. This is another example of the fan array that Ben was talking about. And you could also see the flow arrows sort of corresponding in color to the previous slide where you have your blue outside air going away from you and you have your exhaust air coming towards you. That exhaust air heats up that red wheel in the middle of the space, which will spin, so you get uniform temperature uh, increase, and that'll heat up the incoming outside air. Above and below the red wheel are economizer dampers. So if we find that we have temperature that, that allows us to condition a space at a, at a rate that we, at a temperature that we feel comfortable with, we could turn off the wheel, we could open those dampers, and then air can flow freely through those. Um, the image on the right is a similar idea, but on the, the diamond on the far right is your stationary core that does the same idea, but it's not a, it's not a moving piece. So it's, it's you know, that, that's something to consider when you're talking about maintenance. Dwayne asked us to talk a, a little bit about the fact that you have to have economizer for all new cooling systems, which includes server rooms and electronic equipment rooms. You must meet DOAS with heat recovery ventilation in order to admit this requirement. This is a pretty, overall DOAS is a pretty fast payback when you're, when you're considering multifamily. And last thing, considering demand control ventilation, there are, some, there are some challenges with turndown, as Ben mentioned before, that you can sort of alleviate with fan wall systems, but you need to be cognizant of your operating points and your fan curves to make sure your equipment doesn't, can, can effectively run, it doesn't go off the curve and go into a hunting zone. So speaking of energy recovery and heat recovery, Ben, can you talk a little bit about effectiveness and efficiencies of these systems? Now, let's take that next slide. No, it's a psych chart. 
It's a psych chart. Dwayne has assured us that architects know how to read these. And I'm sure every engineer in the room knows how to read this. Uh, I have to say, they didn't hand us a psych chart until our third uh, third quarter. I did quarters, not seminars, on, um, on psychrometrics and, uh, and thermodynamics. And it was a revelation. It was the most amazing thing in the world. So got to chart it out. So what we're showing here is heat recovery. Uh, for the code, for Washington, you need 60% heat recovery, and it's effectiveness, not efficiency. So a way to think of effectiveness is if you've got a 20 degree delta between inside and outside, you get 10 degrees of it back. That would be a 50% effectiveness. I can't do that much math on the top of my head, but you know, you get, what, 12 degrees back for a 60% effectiveness. Great. Uh, for ease of ease of showing, I showed a 50% effectiveness here. They the out the inside air is cooled down and the outside air is heated up equally pretty simple um for seattle it's 60 percent heat and energy um for washington it's 50 percent energy 60 percent heat so let's go to the next slide because that is the energy version and you'll see that it's not only sensible heat it is also um latent heat, or as Zach said, humidity-based. Um, and we get this question from our clients who are in the know and from some other engineers, um, what is better, energy or heat recovery? And I know every client we have loves a, well, it depends if, you know, answer. But it is a, it depends if answer. I, I honestly cannot tell you one is better than the other without having an energy model for that particular case. It depends on your indoor requirements, your humidity requirements, your outdoor requirements. What I can say is in multifamily buildings where we've done that, there's a slight edge on the energy recovery ventilator. They tend to be better than that 50% minimum and getting that humidity back is better for comfort. So that, that's what I can tell you, but I wouldn't even hold that as a rule of thumb. It, it could be specific to the buildings we've modeled so far. All right. Even in Seattle, Ben, I mean, where where we never have humidity and heat at the same time. Yes. So you lose when you don't have that hot, hot and humid, you lose some of the benefit of energy recovery because you don't get to reject humidity of the incoming airstream instead of having to dehumidify it in some way. It's true. But you still get a minor effect. And so all things being exactly the same, it's a real toss up. Um, and of course, things aren't always the same. That's why you gotta run the energy model. So on the cooling side, I'm with you. On the heating side, particularly if you're having to humidify air for some process need or a hospital or you know data centers like to have a pretty high humidity to prevent spark, um, static discharge, um, you probably have a great reason to go energy recovery. Uh, but otherwise, you really got to look at it case by case. So before we go to a break, uh, we're, we're making pretty good time here. But Mr. Armando, sir, do we have any questions in or can we can we take a couple of questions? Uh, I imagine there must be some unless we've stunned everybody with all this information. <laughs> uh, we've got them in the chat. This is Ben. Yep. And so far, we've answered them. Um, maybe you could speak, Dwayne, a little bit further to how carbon was set at the state level for TSPR. How, how'd you get those factors? Uh, the, the factors for everything except electricity are pretty well known and non-controversial. The, the factor for electricity, which we set for commercial buildings that 0.7 pounds of carbon emissions per kilowatt hour um, was was the subject of a huge amount of, of debate and and uh, it, it, there were a couple of camps you know one which was going for a 0.55 instead of 0 0.70 another which was going for 0.95 um, and and it depends on a lot of factors. How do you uh, how do you decide 
what that marginal use is. We, all of our energy efficiency uh, that we've been adding has actually accommodated for the last 20 years, all of our growth in, in population has been accommodated not by building new plants, but by energy efficiency. So that would be, you know, essentially a zero carbon thing. Uh, on the other hand, as, as uh, you mentioned, Ben, uh, we're still part of the Western interconnect, right? And, and uh, when we flip on a light switch here, it might mean that somebody in Wyoming is shoveling another chunk of coal into a, into a burner there to generate electricity. So we came up with this 0.70. It's going to be revisited again, I think, for this next uh, state code cycle. But it was as close as we could come. And in fact, at the uh, very late in the game, uh, the factor for the residential side of the code was changed to 0 0.8. So, so the electrons that go into houses that will be built from now on are slightly dirtier, I guess, than the electrons that go into buildings. Totally, it, it absolutely works that way. I'm here to tell yeah. you. <laughs> will you uh, hit the next slide? Uh, we don't have any other questions unless somebody, I don't know if we can have folks raise their hand or not. Uh, if for yeah. questions, we, we encourage people just typing them in in, uh, in chat. And if I see questions that uh, that are not answered, that can be the discussion. I'll I'll ask the question uh, live. But yeah, Sounds great. Chat, so we're uh, uh, we're doing good for time here. So so we're going to give you uh, uh, since we're really generous four minutes um, to get up and uh, uh, move around the theater and greet some other people, and uh, we'll be back for more exciting HVAC news. Okay, so that'll be ten minutes to the hour. We'll be back. Thank you very much, Duane, and thank you, uh, Ben, for answering some of these questions in chat and answering for everyone to see. Uh, that That's very helpful. And uh, again, as people have more questions or want to have any comments addressed, please, again, go into chat and, and, and let us know.
All right, and we're back. Hey, Dwayne, before coming in, uh, do you mind answering a Dennis Martinowick? Uh, he mentions he's from Sound Transit, Transit and mentions, is there a value to expecting that new buildings outside Seattle meet the new Seattle HVAC code or will changes at the state level cover it? Outside of Seattle territory. No, re really interesting question and, and a difficult one for an agency like Sound Transit that spans across uh, the jurisdictions. Um, as as time goes on, it's typical that that uh, things that are successful in the Seattle code then are picked up in the state code, especially now there's going to be some real pressure to move forward faster at the state code level. So it could be that it, in future years we pick those up. Uh, there are some organizations already that that have internal policies that just say that they go with the Seattle code outside of Seattle uh, all, just because they're able to capture a higher level of energy efficiency. What, one more consideration I would I would recommend then is is that uh, for for larger buildings uh, that you might develop, they're going to be under the jurisdiction of um, the that state uh, uh, building performance standards rule that went into effect last year, and and so building uh, a ways above the current code is one way that you can protect yourself from having to upgrade systems, you know, a, a decade from now. Can I tag into that as well? Please. Uh, so we've worked on sound transit projects on the design side, and we've also worked helping on the permitting side. And so sound transit taken that Seattle energy code, I can say definitively on an energy modeling basis for stations, gives you a slightly better performance than the Washington based code. So if that's your point, great, keep doing that. Um, and it also leads to some code confusion on the code permitting side, where we get Seattle forms or Seattle other things in a Washington state jurisdiction. So there's probably some room for process cleanup all the same. There, there are also a few jurisdictions uh, locally that are discussing anyway, bringing, uh, bringing many or most of the Seattle code amendments into their codes. Uh, so, so it might be that other jurisdictions in this next several months uh, get on board as well. Lots of them have these big grand plans for how they're gonna be carbon neutral in some particular day and eventually get to start doing it. Okay, welcome back everybody to the second half of our show here. Uh, ASHRAE on this slide was nice enough to let Seattle publish their nifty new table for heat pumps and heat recovery chillers. However, AHRI uh, hasn't quite caught up yet um, with with um, rating uh, equipment to this uh, table. Uh, so we've included some rules of engagement on this in the section right before the, the tables, the C403.3.2. And, and in there, it'll give you some instructions on how to uh, deal with things. But this is, this is actually quite useful because uh, before we had this, there were a lot of, of uh, systems that almost but not quite passed because, um, yeah, heat pump or heat recovery chillers have just some extra valves and things that take them down a percent. Um, this next one is very big for apartments. You can't just use trickle vents and a bathroom exhaust anymore. Every apartment has to have mechanical ventilating air delivered to each habitable room and heat recovery on the exhaust. And this shows uh, uh, in the picture a little ERV size for a single apartment, but um, maybe Zach here has a better idea. Thanks, Dwayne. Yeah, so kind of going through three considerations when talking about DOAS systems for these occupancies. So first, energy recovery and heat recovery. We often get the question of which one do you use particular to the circumstance, and I'm here to give you your favorite answer from an engineer. It depends. Uh, the fastest way to get that information is doing a full year energy model. So for example, Ben and I worked on a off-grid uh, off uh, single, single occupant home 
that was modular. And we found that an energy recovery ventilator, even in Seattle, was the way to go based on a full year energy model. So we would suggest taking the time to do that. From a cost perspective, we've been finding that these units are about $700 per unit, plus the cost of ducting and installation. So if you plan about $1,500 per apartment, that'll probably get you in the, in the, in the ballpark. A rooftop DOAS unit, a centralized DOAS unit, is similar in cost to a conventional air handling unit. But when you take into consideration the extra ducting, fire dampers, and duct distribution, it's going to get a little higher. The uh, upside of doing a central unit versus an individual unit for each apartment is that your penetrations, and your number of penetrations, and the size of those penetrations are going to be minimized with a central unit. And that's going to help with your building leakage requirements that you have to fulfill by code. Last, from an energy standpoint, DOAS is a much more, we find that DOAS is a much more efficient system. As much as 20% energy savings in these residential applications, it's about, a, it's about a four or less than a year, uh, less than four year payback on these localized systems. And from a whole building, it varies somewhere between eight to 15 year payback. Most of these DOAS units have ECM fans. So you could dial in the exact rate that you're looking for, which can be very helpful in your bathroom exhaust fan situation that, De that Dwayne was mentioning before. If you are going with an individual unit and you have an existing HVAC closet, these small individual DOAS units can often fit in those existing HVAC closets. And again, something to consider, and this is something that Ben mentioned before, consider, the co consider who is carrying the cost and the, the energy benefits between the occupant and the developer. Last, you could also enhance these DOAS units with a boost mode for kitchen ventilation, which is another thing to consider. So we've talked about ventilation. Dwayne, what do you think about space heating? Well, funny you should ask. Um, uh, th this is one of the big deals from this particular code cycle, uh, and it's it's where we're taking our, our climate action uh, directives seriously. So we're saying that um, Whereas the current code discourages uh, uh, use of fossil fuel or electric resistance um, uh, in a way that mostly results in people using uh, using heat pumps. Now we just said no. What we really meant was you, you can't use electric resistance or fossil fuel for space heating. Um, now there's a whole long list of exceptions that that uh, uh, allow electric resistance heat for uh, small loads and for auxiliary heat and really cold weather. But notice the question marks I put after exception number one. There's currently some possibility that city council will set that date back to Mar March 15th with the rest of the code like it was originally. Um, also note that 750 watts per room exemption for apartments and 1,000 watts for corner rooms. Unless you have giant windows in your building like some of our downtown high-rise Apartments have uh, just about any apartment can make that work uh, for their heating needs. So you can have a certain amount of electric resistance. Um, and the thought was, once you get to a certain small size, this really doesn't make sense to have to have a heat pump. So um, that's you, you see, I've got the first several uh, exceptions there, but there's a whole bunch more. Uh, those ones on the left tell you the thresholds for electric resistance backup and the ones on the right are miscellaneous other little uh, heat uses for for special situations so not time to go into them individually today but you might want to spend some time looking at all those exceptions and now ben's going to tell you how to deal with all this <laughs> remembering that we said cost effective right in the title again um we're going to talk about the simple systems first so great airside systems you can use um you're gonna want to use heat pumps again and you might get away with those minimum heat pumps you know with a like the one on the left the one that we're all familiar with in our houses um and the uh the the, the higher likelihood is that you're going to some of the variable speed compressors and so we show three of them here that are standalone little units but you're also gonna be talking about VRF as a possibility. And when we get to talking about refrigeration a little later on in the presentation, keep in mind what we talked about. Uh, let's go to the, oh yeah, and we should say, so you get your heating, 
but as a bonus, you get air conditioning. That in Seattle is now a thing. You know, we we have enough hot summer days that that's a benefit to people, and that's something you can you can sell to occupants. Let's go to the next slide. So this this is probably not residential only, but if you're seeking to be all electric, um, and you have a big enough building to justify a central plant, we're showing that heat pump chiller or heat recovery chiller, they get called both things. Again, Dwayne said, and he's right, they're, they're, not, they're really lacking in rating at this point, um, but that will be quickly rectified. Uh, and it looks a lot like a chiller. Uh, it has some temperature limitations you need to know about. Um, the maximum it's gonna make is about 160 degrees. Um, and it's better to be designing much lower than that for the equipment. Uh, there's some defrost cycles that we've gotten ourselves in trouble with on capacity. Um, and if you are careful and you're working with a reputable vendor, it's a perfectly achievable thing. Uh, on the left is a more common scenario, and it's very, very large systems. But if you've got a centrifugal chiller, you've got a condenser side and an evaporator side, and you can start capturing the heat and rejecting it to your heating plant if you're low enough temperature um, when you can run them in a heat recovery mode. So great. Again, those are larger systems. It's going to be very large buildings where those start to pay back. And, and could I just uh, chime in here that that um, when working with a, a, an applicant that, that was doing an, an alteration on an existing building and needed to, uh, on extremely cold days, to provide 180 degree water there is in fact uh, uh at least one manufacturer that does that does have a single pass system that will get you up to 180 so it's, it's unusual but not impossible so yeah it's extremely energy intensive to get to 180 we'll say it that way <laughs> yeah well if you're only getting to that super high temperature on uh, on a, an extremely rare day i mean when how often do we have uh, days in the in the mid twenties? Um, then then uh, that's having having higher energy use for a little bit is not a big deal. Uh, so uh, simultaneously heating and cooling. Uh, traditional mechanical design says that there's a magic invisible wall about 15 feet inboard of the window, so you can have one thermostat controlling the perimeter heating and a separate controlling the interior cooling, and they both function independently. They don't touch each other. Um, this insanity has been going on for generations, but our new code says, no, you can't heat and cool the same zone at the same time. Uh, actually, our current code ha ha is saying that, but it still seems new to people. Why it's even necessary to say this is beyond me, but um, drives me crazy. Seattle does a clearer job of, of saying it, but both codes say that if there's an opening between two spaces that's bigger than 10% of the floor area of either side, then they're the same space. Got it? So, Ben, are you going to back me up on this or not? <laughs> uh, it's tempting to throw you under the bus, but, um, but no, uh, Dwayne basically has it right. So, I'm showing you the one case in which you might choose to have perimeter zones and interior zones. Uh, you've got some high occupancy thing and you've got that perimeter zone that's all glass. And it's worth saying that this version of the code, it is extraordinarily difficult to build a glass high rise that's all glass and, and not all that well insulated. And if you're gonna do that and you don't like this provision, it's a pretty easy thing to put, uh, you know, heated radiators around the perimeter to deal with the downdraft off that giant glass window that you probably can't build. Um, so we're more or less halfway into my career. I'm, I'm surprised this continues to be a thing with, with good building envelopes and proper air distribution. And the way that we're setting up buildings nowadays, that they aren't those giant 100 foot, you know, block size, 100 by 100 floor plates. They, they tend to be longer, skinnier wings so that everybody's got good daylight. We're really not doing interior and exterior zones anymore. We're really more concerned about occupancy, high occupancy and lower occupancy, um, and solar loading to some extent. Um, so generally speaking, this isn't a thing in our lives anymore. But if it is, consider installing separate radiators to deal with 
the problem at its source. Right. My my office building, you know, is 35 years old and and uh, has non thermally broken uh, aluminum framing and and a certain amount of leakiness. And yeah, it's uncomfortable at that window wall. But and anything built now, it's uh, really pretty comfy. Yep. Oh yeah. So. Uh, demand control ventilation we already mentioned. These are these are the C403.7. It's like the catch-all, right? It's all the other stuff. Um, so demand control ventilation, occupancy sensors, ventilation, heating control, all these are things that you will have already seen. The real change is in kitchen hoods and to some extent in energy recovery for labs. Let's go to the next slide. So kitchen hoods, well, you now have requirements for the maximum CFM per linear foot, and they already they comply pretty easily within what manufacturers should be giving you anyways for from an efficiency standpoint. There's also some limitations on where you can introduce makeup air and where you can't. Um, but it's all pretty straightforward and it's pretty a pretty low bar. Um, the only one that I think is maybe maybe a little exciting is that you've got to have some level of heat sensing and fan control. That's where the real energy saving is, is going to be in these. Um, and so that's, that's exciting. That's just good practice at this point. They're relatively cheap, individually packaged controls uh, that just sit on the hood front. So easy going. So talking about fans, um... The, the metric for fan efficiency is changing from FEG to FEI, and the Washington Code still shows FEG, but increasingly the, the, the fan products you're going to see are just going to show their FEI score. So in Seattle, we put an exception that allows an FEI score instead. Uh, also, there's a table for exhaust fan efficacy that, that's messed up in the state code, but fixed in Seattle. I recommend that you just go ahead and use the Seattle table and probably the state everywhere else will understand. Um, certain buildings, uh, you you have to do heat recovery from exhaust air and use that heat for heating water. If you've got steam, you have to recover heat from the condensate. And if you've got a lot of refrigeration, like a grocery, uh, you have to make use of that condenser heat. And not only that, but um, in certain buildings, uh, uh, these are buildings that run more than 70 hours a week and, and have a lot of heat rejection and have reheat coils, you've got to do some serious business heat recovery. Right, Ben? Yes. And so Dwayne said, yeah, right? Like, this is going to be great. And I, I started going, wait a, wait a second. So DOAS now, re now includes all the things it did in the last code, plus assembly occupancies. How many other buildings are going to run 70 hours a week with a huge heat rejection? And there's also a high enough loads for 0.45 CFM per square foot, which we can usually get under with office buildings, and which would be recovered by requ uh, required DOAS anyway. So if you do DOAS, you don't have to do these other heat recovery things. But I could come up with hospitals, maybe. And for that, waterside heat recovery, freak yeah. There, there's a lot of good savings there. Uh, the refrigeration condenser heat recovery for groceries is going to be large grocery stores. They should be doing it anyways. There'll be money ahead in a couple of years. Um, the process heat recovery, there's going to be things like industrial process that maybe we're going to end up doing heat recovery. We wouldn't have had to otherwise. Um, but that's great. They'll get, they'll, they'll get heat recovery back off of that. It's going to be pretty good. Um, there is one clause in here that you... Uh, have an economizer lockout on heat recovery systems. Uh, so this is similar to what we would recommend on water source heat pumps. If you've got water source heat pumps in heating mode on a system, uh, or in this case, air handlers on a, on, a, on a system, you have to continue to reject heat to the loop instead of using economizer until your loop temperature starts climbing in water source heat pumps. It would look something similar here until your heating demand was was satisfied, you wouldn't use economizers. Uh, so you basically get 
free, and I put that in air quotes because you are moving it around with a heat pump, but you get free heating from the cooling loop um, instead of having that air uh, heat reject outside. Neat clause. Anyways, oddball buildings, not going to be triggered all that often. OK. Um, the, the great outdoors. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time sitting at outdoor cafes lately. You know, I still, I used to live in Alaska and I still had those huge clunky boots of mine. So I wear them and sit out there in the freezing cold. But um, I'm not really sure how effective these radiant heaters are, especially when there's a little breeze, but we're desperate right now, right? So the rules are that you've got to use the radiant heaters outdoors, not space heaters of any kind, of course, uh, so that those humans in, in the line of sight will at least sense a little heat. And they have to turn off automatically when no one's around. So in Seattle, we extended these rules to include radiant heaters in unheated spaces, like some kinds of repair garages and stuff. Uh, and we put a 20 minute limit on the auto off control. And, and finally, I've, I've just tossed in here for all of you who come to me saying, oh, we're just installing a little space heating for freeze protection, just enough to get it up to 45. I have to say, you're either conditioned space, semi-conditioned, or low energy. There's not a freeze protection category for space heating. So uh, in some, you might want to use uh, uh, some other form of of, uh, uh, of heating to deal with with protecting your your pipes and such. I took this picture in Oregon last month where. It got so scary for them with the COVID that now they don't even allow outdoor dining uh, at restaurants, but this fire pit was still blazing away, keeping the owls warm. Um, so the rules are that uh, this kind of uh, fireplaces, fire pits uh, have to be manual on, which means it doesn't just blink on whenever somebody walks by. And then it either turns off automatically after an hour so you'd have to go reset it, or it turns off automatically when no motion has been sensed for 15 minutes. Figure if if there's been no motion for 15 minutes and you're still there, you're probably asleep, so it's okay. So, okay, we've arrived at C406, um, which has been reorganized into a points-based table with each option and each occupancy type getting different points. So what I've got circled here shows that a school gets two credits for the HVAC efficiency option. In, in Washington, you'd need six credits, and in Seattle, you need eight credits total, but you'd get uh, two for that. Um, now, remember I said that we got rid of double dipping in the DOAS section, but one vestige of it remains here, and that's that multifamily buildings can still get two credits for DOAS, which is a gimme because remember that we now require apartments to have balanced ventilation with heat recovery anyway. You know, they caught me on a good day, I guess. What could I say? Um, I did want to say a couple of things about HVAC uh, efficiency option, although for some reason engineers start smirking when I start talking about engineering principles. But um, first, you, you could only use this option for equipment that actually has table values in those 13 tables. And second, that in Seattle, uh, we're not gonna allow gas equipment to qualify for those additional credits at all. Uh, the basic requirement though is for all equipment to be 15% better than code. Uh, this doesn't work out for certain combinations of equipment. So we said you can do a weighted average of your equipment to get your 15%. Um, with as long as nothing is is uh, is worse than five percent better than code. Okay, um, Washington exempts heat recovery chillers, but Seattle includes them now because we got that nifty ASHRAE table. So, Ben, I think I probably just confused them with all that. Uh, do you want to clear it up for them a little? <laughs> yeah, let's go to the next slide. So the rules are these: uh, everything has to be five percent better. You can't use gas in Seattle on these. And in Washington state, very, very large boilers are exempted. So, and you, you average by capacity, so capacity weighted average to greater than 15%. So 
So Dwayne asks, what, what types of equipment can't achieve this? It's a very few chiller types. They just can't hit that 15%, but they can certainly hit 5%. Uh, Oil-fired boilers, but most of the time they will be over the exempt size. But if they're under, oil-fired boilers won't be able to hit 15%, but they can certainly hit 5%. Uh, ground source VRS systems, it's just a very high threshold. Same thing, they'll be able to get above five. Uh, the heat pump heat recovery chillers that aren't yet rated, obviously that's a thing. And there are some, like, like Dwayne said, there's some guidance for that in the code, an informative note. Um, and then Dwayne asked, does the higher efficiency equipment cost more? So the answer is yes, probably. Um, and in most cases, it has a pretty aggressive payback. And do remember that this is C406, so it's very much choose your own adventure. And you don't have to take this as the option. You can go ahead and choose something else. So this slide has a lot of words on it, but um, basically it says you can get the HVAC credit for your tenant spaces if the shell and core has a qualifying system that is going to extend into those new tenant spaces. Or for that matter, maybe your tenant space could go for this credit in a building that didn't install a, a high performance central system. Uh, so you got that if the if you've got something great. And, and all you're doing is is hooking it up to those terminal units in the in the tenant space, and you can you can make that work. But Zach, let's hear it from an actual engineer. Thanks, Dwayne. So uh, Dwayne had a couple of questions for us about exactly what you just said: the the transition of the points-based system from C406 and how it impacts shell and core systems in tenant spaces. So the code says that the initial TI shall comply with C406 to get the number of points. And if you have a building with multiple TI spaces, each tenant can apply for different packages, provided that the entire building has the minimum number of points. So just something to consider. All of this to say, for the most part, when you're talking about mechanical systems, by the time you're building out your TI, you've probably already committed to your system type. For example, consider a VRF system, your condensing units are going to be part of your shell and core design, and then your indoor units would be part of whatever TI you're doing. So yeah, once you've put in your condensing units, you're committed to that system type. Any system types that would qualify for the C406 credit at the shell and core level, I guess the question is, are there any of those system types that don't that qualify for the, the shell and core but don't qualify for tenant spaces? And again, we're usually talking about the fact that we're locked in by the time we get to our TI, but a notable exception to this would be lab spaces. Lab spaces have that a lot of standalone equipment that have that fan efficiency grade and now fan efficiency index rating. And you're often looking at, you know, depending on the size of that equipment, you're often looking at rooftop units. So that would be the one, the one exception that really comes to mind. When it comes to, I think next we're going to talk a little bit about fossil fuel burning equipment, Wayne, is that correct? Uh, yeah. So um, I mentioned this one a little earlier, but note that there are four credits that don't allow fossil fuel equipment. We're we're trying to wean ourselves off of this stuff as as quickly as possible here in in Seattle, and and lead the way for other parts of the state and the country, uh, and. This not only applies to that uh, DOAS thing, but see, it applies to those four systems. So the HVC sele selection, the high performance DOAS, and the, and the water heating all are required that if you want those credits, you got to do something not fossil fuel burning. Now, Zach's got a cool chart here. Yeah, so this is the, this is the C406 additional energy efficiency options that we've sort of taken and made a couple of things pop. So uh, you, you may have heard a couple of times we've talked about choose your own adventure. Ben Ben introduced the, in the 2015 code, he would always tell me that C406 was sort of choose your own adventure from the Goosebump books. And now that's all I ever think about. And yes, as Dwayne said, now it's a cumulative point system. So for Washington State, you need a total of six points. And for Seattle, you need a total of eight points. This marked up image is a, sort of our best guess at cost-effective options based on your building type. 
So green is go, green is yes, and then orange is your second cheapest option. So a couple of things just to bring to your attention, for R1 and R2 occupancies, as well as health clubs, spas, and laundries, uh, heat pump water heating is a really clear choice for those options, for those occupancies. Lighting reduction is also a great choice. And the building method for lighting uh, for lighting reduction is a 10% threshold that's li likely easier to obtain than the space by space method. Not likely to be for M occupancies because M occupancies love their lighting, but just something to consider. And then again, just rehashing this, Remember that unlike the 2015 code, you cannot double dip for DOAS for the most part. So if your code, if your if the code is already requiring you to do DOAS, it doesn't account here, and that's why it's called additional energy efficiency options. So office, education, retail, library, assembly spaces, conference spaces, you're going to need to find uh, other areas to get your six or eight points. If your building doesn't have doesn't require DOAS or high performance VAV, it really is still a good option that you should weigh against something like solar. For schools that tend to be two stories and for M occupancies that typically have sprawling roof areas, solar PV is obviously a really good choice. And then two more, reduced air infiltration doesn't have a lot of cost associated with it, but the target is pretty aggressive at 0.17 CFM per square foot. So it's a, it's a great idea to have a conversation with your construction team, with your design team to make sure that that's something that you could adequately detail because this requirement is, is really approaches that passive house requirement. And then last, you can decrease your UA trade-off by 15%. It works for most projects and may not cost, may not cost all that much given the long-term benefit. If you're gonna do it, focus on your insulation and, 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 and consider increasing your continuous. All right, C406, done. Dwayne, can we talk about some carbon-based modeling, specifically Appendix G? Well, what the heck? Uh, let's go for it. Um, <clears throat> so March 14th, uh, unless uh, unless we've changed to July, uh, should be the last day that you can use Washington's current C407 modeling routine that we've known and loved for 20 years. Um, and then we're all switching over to the ASHRAE Appendix G method. And not only that, but we're switching ASHRAE's metric from energy costs to carbon emissions. So the red circle shows where an office is only allowed to emit 54% as much carbon as it would have under an old ASHRAE code. The reason they actually chose that baseline, which is the 2004 ASHRAE 90.1, is because that was the last time that any national energy code was straightforward enough that you could, you could reliably determine a baseline. So from now on, that baseline stays the same, and, and we just have uh, more aggressive uh, uh, reductions from that, from that point. Now, because of all these advances that Seattle's been making to the code that we've talked about with you for the last hour, um, Seattle, the target is 10% lower. So the office can only emit 49% as much carbon as that 2004 ASHRAE uh, building would have done. Um, and and these these percentages there, that's the building performance factor, the BPF. We've hit you with another acronym, um, but it's only a three-letter acronym instead of a four. Uh, so here's two related tables from the code. The first one just shows how we convert each energy source to carbon emissions. Um, and as we mentioned in a, a question, now that one of the top says each kilowatt of electricity is responsible for 0.7 pounds of carbon, very scientifically determined, as I told you, right? Um, and, but that was at the end of a really, really days long argument and we had to just arrive at something. The, the second one is just that, that chart that shows you those building performance factors that you uh, saw in the last slide. The ones crossed out are Washington State and the ones underlined are, are the, the Seattle targets. So, uh, Man, I'm way out of my depth here. Ben, you will help me out, right? Yeah, that's that's the hope. Although I, I am going to warn you all that I am about to show you a whole lot of numbers and several more acronyms. And it would be best if you got your copy of 90.1 2016 out and follow along with me. Um, I believe we're going to give you these slides, so at least you'll have a chance to go review it on your own as well. That is correct. <laughs> yep. So. Great. 
like Dwayne said, 90.1 2016, the Appendix G method is the performance cost index. Let's go to the next slide. Now, first but, you have to explain why you used a dartboard for um, the image oh, you here. Got, you got to hit this in the bullseye. I mean, obviously. No, <laughs> it's um, it's because it, it it feels a little bit like playing darts because it's so specific to your building building factors and um, like it's 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 the ultimate in, in it depends answer. So if you want me to take make real predictions, I'm going to need a dartboard. Um, so first off, performance cost index from 90.1 is based on, like it says, performance cost index. It's building cost. Uh, similar to other ways, 90.1 is done past rating. You know, it's really cost based and it's energy cost. Um, this one is carbon based. So you can see that in number two and any references to uh, carbon are changed out or sorry, costs are changed out to carbon. Let's go to the next slide. These factors should be pretty familiar to you. Um, and, oh, sorry, that's on the, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, important things to take away. So this is a big old, acronym filled um just horrible equation but it's not actually that hard Dwayne said building performance factor and let's stick with office 0.56 great and this is from appendix g 0.54 for for washington we'll show you side by side charts in a bit so you take your building performance factor you multiply it by your regulated energy another way to say regulated energy is to say what it's not um unregulated energy is um, commercial refrigeration, kitchen equipment, uh, sometimes elevators and escalators, plug loads, uh, industrial process loads, um, sometimes special ventilation systems if they're manufacturing based. Um, so you're not getting dinged for those. Those live kind of to the side, the unregulated loads. The regulated loads get multiplied by the building performance factor, and you come up with your own target, your performance cost index target, PCIT. And I'll show you an example building in a bit because this is really hard to follow. But stick with me. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So the, here's your carbon conversions from kilowatts and therms, which is what I had to use. And this is a really important caveat. I showed you in Appendix G, this table is the amount of window area your baseline has. So let's say we're a multifamily building. Well, let's say we're an office building because that's the most permissive. Then your baseline has a 40% window area. Great. But if you're some other kind of building, grocery store is at 7%, uh, warehouse at 6%, and for some reason you wanted that to have a bunch of glass, your proposed would have the glass, your baseline would have this minuscule amount of glass, and um, it gets very difficult to actually meet your target. So know that that's, that's the case. And also your UA factor is required to be within, I believe 20% of the C402 uh, method UA factor. Um, this is a long way of saying that energy models aren't going to let you put in amazing mechanical systems and get your way out of uh and, and get to put in huge glass panes we're, we're gonna be it's gonna be darn near impossible i'll put it that way to build a all glass tower in this code and for most developers okay but um that, that's a thing to realize. So when we when we start seeing those and we know they're coming under 2018, that took, that would have been a great thing to do two code cycles ago. Okay, so next slide. The how hard is this? Um, I couldn't do this without showing you a bunch of numbers. So stick with me. Uh, next slide. The first thing we have to say is that the climate zone matters here. So for 90.1 2016, it's climate zone based. Great. You've got 4C that we are in in Seattle, and you've got uh, 5B that, that the other side of the state lives in. As Dwayne said, there's a little bit of six in there, but uh, for the purposes of the code, they're made an honorary climate zone five. Okay, let's go to the next slide. 
So PNNL, the Pacific Northwest National Labs, does these great reports for every code cycle, and it lets us compare apples to apples. And I will also show you a model we carry forward to compare sort of apples to apples too. But for PNNL, they do every type of building and then do a composite. So you can see, I highlighted two there, 4C, 5B, the two climate zones we're talking about. You can see that it goes from 0.7 to 0.63 for an office. I'm gonna use offices just because. Um, so great, it's about 10% more difficult, jumping 90.1 2010 to 2013. Let's go to the next slide. And we go from 0.63 to 0.58. So it's an 8% again to the 2016 90.1. And if you go look at the building performance factors going from a 0.58 to 0.54, okay, we're doing the same thing again. Uh, let's go to the next slide. You know, so these are, sadly, they don't line up. Like we would, I, I need to make a table where they all line up office to office to office. But if you go look in the office, you can see it's a moderate reduction again. So this is the building performance factor. So let's talk about what that actually looks like in a real model. Let's go next slide. So we've carried this model forward from the 2009 code on. Uh, as built, it was a two, certified in 2011. It was a lead gold building, had a moderate EUI, not, not amazing, not off the charts, pretty good for 2009. It was 37% better than ASHRAE 2010. It actually certified in LEED V2.2 and got all of the energy model points. Uh, it used off the shelf air handling equipment, just um, some McQuay now, uh, now incorporated, uh, McQuay air handlers that were, they're high efficiency, but they weren't amazing. And it was just a standardized VAV with electric reheat. So great, let's go to the next slide. This is how we compare it, and it's on a cost savings basis. So I, it's normalized. Uh, the baseline is always 2010. And you can see across the board that, yes, the 2018 codes uh, for Washington took a real step forward. And um, for Seattle, the real step forward was actually in 2015. Um, great. And you can see in this particular building, DOAS was not as good as VAV. And this was a 24 hour facility um, that had some weird off hours that the, the free cooling of an economizer was really, really beneficial. And so this is a mileage may vary. You can't trust that VAV versus DOAS. This is an industry argument that will continue. And I still can't tell you the answer without an energy model ever. So again, this is all cost basis. I wanna show you what this new version of carbon basis does. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I really have high hopes that maybe not Dwayne, but, but somebody smart um, puts together a, a calculator that does all this for us. We put in the energy use and it does all the background calcs because it was, it was not that much fun to do this math. It took about an hour and a half this weekend to get from energy cost to all of the, uh, the performance cost index. Um, and then another half an hour to convert that to carbon instead. That said, LEED is now letting us do 90.1-2016 performance cost index. I think we're gonna be going this direction and the carbon factors, once you've made a calculator, are pretty easy to do. So great. Uh, remember, you have to calculate a target PCIT, and I did that for Washington State and Seattle. And these will not be the same numbers. These are very building dependent on your exact fuel mix and your exact um, unregulated versus regulated energy. So you'll have to do this on every building to know what your target is. You'll know what your building performance factor was, but the PCIT most of the time will be some number larger than that. Let's go to the next slide. You know, so I, I, did, want to, I did want to say, Ben, that, that what's remarkable uh, is is how close the carbon number came out to the cost number on uh, for those bottoms five lines. Yes. Really, really almost exactly the same. Uh, it is. Yeah. Let me. So, so yes, I highlighted the results that matter there. And remember, I said this was a gas pack VAV rooftop system with electric reheat VAV. So I picked the two worst possible carbon 
uh, heating systems in the building. And this shows, you know, it, got, it had great energy performance over a gas baseline, but this very much shows in this PCI uh, metric. This building, you know, the baseline version, the code minimum, because I picked the worst heating I could on a carbon basis, it, it wouldn't pass. But the PCI actual, this very high performing building that still used not the most ideal on a carbon basis systems, you know, it's it's right at passing. It, it would have passed for Washington, but not for Seattle. So the long takeaway here is that your fuel sources really, really matter for what your carbon-based PCI is gonna be. Um, having it on a carbon basis instead of a cost basis really drives those decisions on a, um, you know, more of a long-term metric than just that first energy cost, what are energy costs today versus the future. Um, so again, I, I strongly hope that NEA and Seattle each release the standard code forms and those code forms have a wonderful calculator built in that does all of this math in the background. You just tell it your kilowatts and your therms and your purchased energy of various types and it, it goes and does the rest. So I'll be crossing my finger for that. All right, last slide. How hard is this? So if you're selecting your systems well, it's not really that hard. Uh, if you're DOAS based, it's probably not that hard. If you want a giant glass tower, it's extremely difficult. And that is, that is part of the point. Um, and most occupancies are gonna give you a baseline with less glazing and you're gonna have to make up for it. Um, so those, those are your takeaways. You know, it, it's 99 years now. It was, it was 1922 that Mies first published that famous image of his, his model he built of an all glass office tower. And us architecture students have not got over it uh, even though it's been three or four generations of architecture professors pushing it. But it might be that the aesthetic thrill of just doing floor to ceiling, wall to wall, glass, glass, glass is, is going to fade. We'll, we'll have to see. Um, so I'm going to share too much, but you know, when I'm in an all glass building, when I step out of that bathroom, it's, it, it doesn't feel great. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent on board for the occupant, occupant, uh, experience of an all glass building yeah some people want to put up guardrails around there <laughs> um so except for very small hvac systems you've got to do commissioning uh and this means submitting your commissioning professionals qualification you've got a, a conflict of interest letter if you're commissioning your own stuff and a checklist to fill out and a commissioning plan and report and I have heard that a number of jurisdictions haven't been checking for this or asking for it, uh, including maybe sometimes in my own jurisdiction, but you never know if your code official might be with us here today, busily taking notes. Ben? <laughs> uh, yes, so you're required to have a certified commissioning professional. There's your definition, like engineers do. Uh, I am one of those, and I'm here to tell you that if you are a if you are a commissioning agent, and you're listening. Go take the test. Pick one of the agencies. It's a nominal, you know, fee. I almost said fine for a second. Um, it's a nominal fee, and it's a test you should be able to pass today without studying. It's it's not a wild thing as long as you can check the minimum requirements. Most of them also give you a benefit for being a PE um, in number of years required. They give you a reduction. So. Great. Other than that, you know, you got to go check with your jurisdiction whether this is going to be be required or not. Um, TSPR also requires a certain energy certification or a PE and some number of uh, some some amount of experience. It's the same thing. You got to check with your jur jurisdiction if it's required. So. Uh, we want a building manager to have an overview of building energy use available on some web page all the time. So uh, you need to meter the incoming source energy and sub-meter several categories of loads. And notice that the state code is now taking uh, some of those sub-metering categories that used to be just found in the Seattle code as well. Um, 
if you're careful about how things are circuited, you can, you can uh, minimize the number of meters required in your system. Yeah, um, from the commissioning side, our firm would never do such a thing. But from the commissioning side, we see a lot of poorly laid out systems where you just got meters everywhere, every end use, um, and it adds up to a really expensive system. If you can minimize the number of meters, great, you can save a lot. And so the way to do that, you're required to have a building level meter, but you have to have loads lumped. So if you had a separate riser for lighting panels, if you had a separate riser for HVAC, plug loads, keep going. Uh, you would need fewer meters. I can't tell you that's the more cost-effective version than just adding a bunch of meters everywhere. It's a it's a back and forth, and it's a it depends. Uh, so these meters are really useful for commissioning, for seeing those first couple months of occupancy and comparing it against the energy model and doing a monitoring-based commissioning process. It's great. It's very in depth. And hypothetically, as Dwayne said, they're useful for maintenance to see if they're staying in tune or to watch themselves go out of tune. So that's, uh, we, we hope longer term they're using them. Okay, so now we're on the home stretch. Uh, C503 is, is alterations. And, and uh, generally anything that was installed legally can stay there forever and it can be serviced and repaired, but any new stuff has to meet code, okay? Now, substantial alterations, everybody's favorite thing uh, is, is Seattle's way of treating a, a big gut and remodel project much uh, pretty much like a new building. And same applies when you change occupancy from something funky like a factory or warehouse to something more polite, or when you add heating or cooling to buildings that didn't have them before. Um, remember that adding cooling requires either DOAS or economizers. And there's this complicated table telling you when and how to add economizer function when you're when you're messing with the cooling system. Uh, but I think Ben's got it figured out, right? Or maybe not. No. So this is a, also an it depends answer. Um, when you're adding cooling, when you're or when you're going from unconditioned to conditioned at large, but particularly when you're adding cooling, it can take every trick in the book and sometimes you just can't do it. So this is a consult your engineer very early. Don't promise anything to your client until you know you have a path forward. Um, many systems are going to trigger that DOAS requirement, which can sometimes add another hitch into the, the, the difficulty, might also make it impossible depending on your building layout and, you know, construction. Um, VRF and uh, four pipe systems and, you know, there are newer systems opening up possibility um, with smaller ducts overall, but in no means is it going to work for every building. So there's no slam dunks here. You got to talk to your engineer and you got to really go digging and make sure you're on solid footing. So, um, when you've got a substantial alteration <clears throat> or when you're just uh, ripping out the old heating system and installing a new one, you have to comply with our uh, in Seattle with our no gas and no electric resistance rule back in C403. We did make an exception, which we're clarifying a bit this year, that if you're just replacing one appliance on an emergency basis, you don't have to upgrade the building, but otherwise, yes, you do. Ben? Yeah, our marketing director gave us this image. I love it. Um, so another sticky situation. Um, why it's a big deal is because when you go from gas, particularly from gas to electric, even for heat pumps, you probably have a capacity situation. So let's say you got a gas pack rooftop with DX cooling, the new unit's gonna be a heat pump. They only go so big in capacity, um, but that capacity keeps moving. We've done them as large as 60 tons now, um, which is a really starting to get into a, a, a fair, fairly sizable air handler. Um, you're also gonna trigger DOAS requirement, some new equipment, and depending on specific heat pump, you might need backup resistance heating. And again, that'll get into your electric capacity. So again, not always a slam dunk. Like Dwayne said, maybe when you just replace your boiler, you just replace your boiler, but otherwise you're gonna be touching that whole system. So uh, Mr. Armando, sir, um, we uh, had put in our, uh, given ourselves a. Uh, bunch of slides on refrigerants, time permitting, but you tell us how many more minutes we got, if any, 
before you need to take over and do your part of the show here. If you can help us with five more minutes, or if you can wrap up in five, I think uh, yep. I think it'll be good. We could do that. Um, I'll just uh, say briefly, you should be aware uh, that the state is serious about global warming from refrigerants. For many researchers, it's, it's our most urgent action. And remember, these dates are for when equipment's being installed, not when it's being permitted. So a really big project you're applying for later this year might be already into those 2024 cutoffs. And notice that California, Canada, Europe, Japan are moving much more aggressively on this. So I'd expect Washington to be stepping up faster as well sometime soon, which is all to say a smart engineer will find systems that work with very low global warming potential refrigerants. So you're gonna all see uh, a bunch more slides from, from Ben and, and Zach uh, on refrigerants, but I think we will dance past those. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, you Let's wanna- do like yeah, one of... minute, but I'm gonna skip some of these. So this okay. is great, shows you the global warming potential. So great, we got rid of ozone depletion. Woo, oh wait, R410A, our most common refrigerant has a really high global warming potential. And of course the systems leak eventually. Let's go two slides down. So we'd love to replace this with something better. So this is a normalized chart. So we want something with a higher coefficient of performance and a higher heat transfer capability, which means we want the upper right hand quadrant and that is R32. That's the only one there. I would take R1123, uh, 1123. You'll note they're both lightly flammable and they take a really big quantity to be flammable, but our current code sets some limits on flammable you know, things in your space, particularly gases. Um, and so there's a code minute, code require, you know, code issue right now that makes R32 kind of difficult. Let's go down two more slides. Uh, so there you can see R32 versus R410A. It's a, a cut of, you know, of two thirds of, of global warming potential. This is why we're talking about this. Also notice CO2 on there you can use CO2 as a refrigerant. It's viable, it works. You can also use ammonia as a refrigerant. It's also viable, it works. Uh, there's some, some technical limitations for both and some life safety things on ammonia. Uh, let's do the last slide. So we need manufacturers to play ball. And right now they're not, which means things like VRF that put R410A all over the building, a huge amount, that's gonna be a thing in 2024. But things that keep it localized, things like chillers that go to, to fluids or little split systems, we're probably on a safe ground. Uh, oh, and teeny unitary equipment is allowed to use propane now, which is a great refrigerant other than the flammability part. Dwayne? Wow, we made it. Um, thank you all so much for being here. As we said at the beginning, we can do this. You all can make this happen. Keep in touch. And now, a few words with customer care and energy solutions. Thanks a lot, Dwayne, Ben, Sack. That was actually a very entertaining uh, series of, of steps. Uh, let's shift over slightly quickly for a little bit of engagement with uh, Emma Johnson, our HVAC program implementer with Seattle City Light. Uh, Emma, I wanted to see if you can start with a with a brief question that someone wrote some time back. Uh, the question read, how might an electric utility determine uh, kilowatt hour savings based on the total system performance ratio simulation? Can you, can you speak a little bit to that first? <laughs> yeah, great. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks again for listening in. So it is something that we're actively uh, looking at and how to quantify the savings from customers that are using the performance-based methodology in the code, including the TSBR. Um, generally, the framework is we want to incentivize energy savings above code. So if you use the TSPR to achieve code compliance, um, we probably wouldn't incentivize that. If you 
go above and beyond, we would. And I think that um, Ben had an example of how you could calculate the kilowatt hour savings for above code savings with that formula. We also incentivize projects that demonstrate performance. So it might be an actual you know, energy performance that we look at, but it, um, we don't have a specific answer right now. And um, we'll be looking at when the code actually becomes um, in effect and, and how we wanna approach projects at that time. Thank you uh, for the comment and the answer. And I know that you're taking some feedback uh, from, from questions here and, and taking it back to, to the division. Uh, right now, we're going to call out a couple of polls to get a bit more of that feedback with, with you guys. And uh, I'm going to start launching them. If you want to just read out, Emma, I'm going to launch the first one. Great. Yeah, so what path or strategy do you believe you'll use most often? The first is the prescriptive path. The second is total building performance path, which is the energy model, and also the target building performance path, which we didn't specifically talk about today. But uh, And thank you. I see responses coming in. I'll give it a bit, uh, about five, 10 more seconds, and I'm going to close the poll. The um, target hey, building performance what, path is Appendix F that we were talking about. That was the, the one crossed out not many people are doing. Um, could I right. um, also just toss in, I, I just got an email forwarded to me that was from the governor's office and, and that a move to move the, the code effective date to July was uh, just repealed. So it'll be back to February 1st for the state and March 15th for Seattle. Oh, wow. great to know. Thanks a lot, uh, Dwayne. So original dates uh, hold. And uh, as we see here, hey, uh, people are looking to split off their time with the prescriptive and total build performance uh, with a couple of stragglers in the target building performance path. Uh, good, solid notes. Wanted to do a couple more, uh, one or two more polls here. And, and great, we're gonna be closing out. What's a next poll that we had for you guys is? What types of HVAC systems do you think you'll most likely use to replace electric resistance or gas heating if applicable? First is air to air heat pumps. Second, water source heat pumps, hydronic systems, chillers, boilers, VRF, variable refrigerant flow, or others? All right, seeing again, a good of people uh, voting another five, uh, 10 seconds. I'm gonna share the, the results here with us. Uh, it's looking like air to air and VRF are, are rather popular strategies. Uh, I'm gonna close it out. Yeah, yeah, good amount of people are looking for those uh, the air-to-air -air heat pumps and, and the VRF. Interesting, again, thank you. Thank you for your participation, guys. It does give us a good amount of feedback as we continue looking to update or design or implement additional programs. Uh, going in another poll. All right, next question. How likely will your future projects to be above code minimum efficiency. Um, a scale there, not at all likely to very likely. And also, if anyone has questions for Emma uh, on the solutions design and management group for City Light, uh, please write them in the chat and I'll call them out if, if we have any. All right, about five more seconds. So apparently very uh, likely and someone likely to, to, to go above code minimum efficiency. So I appreciate the, the, the ambition and the intentions. <laughs> We're gonna do, great to see. <laughs> right. We're gonna do one last poll for everybody before we close out. Last poll is. And what considerations are most important to go above code minimum efficiency? Is it the cost for the uh, first cost of installation? Is it customer interest, supply chain availability, 
project timeline or technical system knowledge. All right. And I think, thank you guys. I see that you guys are, are, are heavily participating. So very, very appreciative of it. Closing it down in about five more seconds, three. So I, yeah, I, we see upfront cost uh, is, is, is still one of those uh, heavy factors as, as well as customer interest because, hey, the decision makers are the ones that control the budget. You know, customers have that power to, to go for it. Well, all right, thank you very much. I'm gonna be closing this out. And if I see that there's no uh, questions and, and never, never uh, Fred, if you have any questions or wanna engage with us, uh, you'll see, you can go to our website, lightdesignlab.com. We have uh, an additional upcoming code topics. The next one is next week, January 26th. We're, we're gonna be discussing uh, building envelopes. Then next week is a lighting. And lastly, February 9th is water heating. Can we go to the next slide, please? Duane. Uh, anyone has any questions to directly for, for Duane or myself as we continue on this uh, series, please, please don't hesitate to ask. Again, when you go to our website, you see the resources tab. We'll have, uh, I believe tomorrow, we'll have the, the slides as a PDF handout. And it should be a recording of this webinar as well on our site and our YouTube page. Uh, any questions that are general, go to lightdesignlab at seattle.gov. And uh, I think we're going on to the last slide, Dwayne. That is all, folks. Thank you for joining us, uh, Dwayne, Ben, and Zach. That was an amazing presentation. It was actually very entertaining and technical, so I appreciate that. Uh, for all of those who joined us as well, we thank you. Ben, if you want to see final goodbyes, we'll be signing off. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, and you have a great rest of your Tuesday.